Good to see you back on our show, Human Humane Architecture here on ThinkTech Hawaii. This is uh, the number of viewer you are, as you see down there, and we are in the 295th show. And we is us uh, in tropical exotic Honolulu, Hawaii, which you can see and hear flora and fauna wise with you, DeSoto Brown. Good day, and, everyone. And me, Martin Despang, back in tempered Munich, Germany, currently under another heavy thunderstorm that was ripping things apart yesterday. Climate change, climate change, inevitably. So, and we're going back to more winds, to windy cities, ours in Honolulu and the one in Chicago, Illinois, DeSoto, to pick up from where we had left. And so let's go to the first slide, um, which I'm sure you watched the show, which I, which I had to do by myself on behalf of us. So, um, this is where we left. This is a firm that I keep teasing you, quizzing you on their name and their relevance to Hawaii, but you know it by now. This is SOM Skidmore Owings Merrill, and we know them because of which projects? Quizzing you again, never letting you off the hook. Look, I scared oh, you again. Hey, you there's did, a, there's well, we, a, we know there's them for a, more than one project. Uh, we know them for uh, the one that I can think of immediately is the uh, Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. Top left, bingo, right. And I helped you out with the other one because that's closer to me work-wise. That is the engineering building on campus at UH. These are the two projects that we were blessed by SOM, which is one of the largest architectural firm in the United States, in the world. And they are headquartered uh, you know, in Chicago. And so they have this new building that we talked about at the top, at the bottom left, uh, Fulton Market place here and i gave it a try to sort of you know analyze it or critique it as an amalgamation of their legacies we see um a little bit of the manatnock building in it which was the last one that was built stereotomically out of solid you know brick six feet at the base and then tapering getting smaller at the top so they try to elude that with that brick we see there, although it's not quite as impressive because you can clearly tell that this is not stereotomic monolithic. And then there is, uh, of course, which you just mentioned at the top left, the stepping down, the cascading of the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. However, we're now in the 21st century, deeply into speaking of which climate change, so what do we see up there at the top left done well and not so well at the new building at the bottom left, DeSoto? Well, I'm trying to see what those two, what those, uh, what those are. Yeah, I know, no, wait, are you alluding to the um, Munich uh, Olympic Village up there? Yeah, that, that one too. And in both cases, yeah. we, have some, we have summer here too. So in summer, we seek the shade, right? Yes, uh, desperately. So all these buildings have that, but in Chicago it gets very hot too, and we don't see any of that because we're looking at the southern elevation. There's some promising greens kind of crawling over the balustrades there, but I'm not sure whenever that will hang down and be so sufficiently to to shade that facade. And the the third influence, very obviously, is obviously the the X bracing. Uh, the cross bracing in steel that's part of the, the structural integrity. And that is borrowed from one of their most memorable buildings, just you know, a few blocks away towards the lake, which is the Hancock building, which we see at the top right. This is a Bruce Graham building. I had to fix an, a bug here because I, you know, I defaulted back to John Graham, who's our favorite architect of our Alamoana high rise, our best and first and in, in, you know, the buildings high rises in Honolulu. But this is not John, this is Bruce Graham, who is with SOM, was is one of the founding design partners and the uh, uh, magnificent, um, crazy uh, engineer, Fazlo Khan. And that was built in 1969. And again, you remember that more than me, although you were pretty little, but I was barely born. But that was before that 73 benchmark that changed everything, right? And what was that? That was the energy crisis. And that was brought on by the war in the Middle East. And uh, when uh, oil exports were cut back by OPEC, the Association of Petroleum Exporting Countries, 
suddenly the rest of the world underwent a terrible retraction and everybody realized, wait a minute, there isn't unlimited energy for all of us to use. And in the USA in particular, people suddenly discovered that these huge cars, the type that you love and the type that I always thought were terrible, suddenly were getting absolutely terrible gas mileage and they realized eight or nine or 10 miles per gallon is unworkable. And that affected, of course, cars, like the picture that we have in the lower right, but it affected uh, architecture as well, certainly in terms of, in many, many ways. Yeah. And, and that one, by the way, I put freshly in from uh, our exotic escapism expert, Susanne, who's working in a school and her superintendent, her boss, drives that car, proudly <laughs> drives that car. <laughs> And his son is is working on these and fixing these. So he promised to get me sentimental, as you indicated already, and give me a ride. And again, that one was probably to be guilted because that was 75. So two years later, that wake up call, that first wake up call, maybe one wasn't quite aware of that. But the Hancock building above it. And, you know, there's certain we have a show going on about autos and architecture, automobiles and architecture. You can see both are sort of high rises in their in their discipline, you know, very long. And one stands up, which is the building, and the other one is horizontal because it has to drive. But uh, and and none of these, as you alluded, we had here. Uh, nor did we have the Schlossenkreuzer, the land yards. Nor did we had high rises back then. But you had them. America invented them. Of course, in Chicago, as we were saying at the beginning of this these episodes, under the guidance of the. German master Mies van der Rohe. Um, and so um, that being said, in 69, grantedly, one was still pretty innocent about fossil fuel. So the Hancock building didn't really know better or SOM at that time, right? But now give us a break. At the beginning of the 21st century with all these wake up calls, maybe we would have loved to see a little bit more of their, you know, Mauna Kea Beach Hotel and UH Engineering School, which are pretty uh, decent tropical exotic buildings that take shade into account. In Chicago, it's more tricky because we got that winter thing that we don't have in Hawaii. So you've got to basically harvest uh, the sun in the winter and at the same time shy away from it and shade yourself from it in the uh, summertime. So more tricky conditions that we are both aware of, by the way, because I grew up in it and you spend some of your early childhood a little further east, but as cold in Boston, Massachusetts. So um, there is a, a company that likes to go into iconic buildings. That's one of the corporate coffee roasters in the world coming from uh, America starting in the 70s, speaking of 70s, and that's the next slide. And that is Starbucks. And Starbucks has also acquired, snapped a space in the prominent building. And you see that iconic X bracing there being sort of, you know, um, almost fetishized in the interior design. Uh, we reminded the audience, you the audience, that we have one on Cujillo Avenue that is a Starbucks reserve, which is also which went into the building at the show quote top right, the large picture, which is the former crate and barrel store on Michigan Avenue, the Magnificent Mile, uh, our uh, what Kalakaua Avenue in, is in Honolulu, is that for Chicago. And now there's a Starbucks reserve in there. And that is by the architects that we identified. We're heavily influenced uh, high-rise wise. That is Solomon Portwell Buens. And back then when I was there as a student in the early nineties, that was kind of the, the hottest thing. And although it was a little uh, copycatted from Richard Maya, we thought, but it was still kind of the best around, which is a little sad because it isn't really like, you know, one of the coolest building, but it was okay. and. Um, and but they kept it, uh, give them that, which one should in these days. And uh, again, one um, these architects were very, you know, we watching them very closely because they drop one after another high rise on our islands that we keep to watch. We see a wood as a material to contrast the steel, which is very catchy. That wood is always on the inside, so it never really changes or weathers. But uh, next slide, let's throw in a little bit of um, um, life cycle assessment, post-occupancy evaluation, um, evidence-based design stuff here from my hometown of Hanover, the treetop apartments that we've been talking about a while here and there over the years. 
uh, I'm always going back every summer and check it out how it ages because that's when buildings show if they really work or what doesn't work. So this building is now 20 years young. Um, it has, which you always say you like and everyone should have in Honolulu, has lanais, lots of them large ones. And it has wood and that wood is under glass. And that is good in some cases as the, the, the ground floor retailer, which is a physiotherapist here, has a signage on there, which looks very appealing. Um, and then the top floors have uh, glass garbage, which we caution and say, don't do them in Hawaii. But in Germany, where it's you know not always warm, it's over the year, it turns out to be more beneficial because it's more cold and warm. So um, that being said, um, wood um, is, again, is sort of a decorative element here, alluding to a former half-timbered, uh, cute little house that stood there that was not to be saved. But now we want to go to all uh, solid timber, structural solid timber, to the next slide. And this is a project here. We are feeding ourselves from this literature, which um, is by DOM publishers that we are supposed to do. And we'll, we promise we will soon uh, go back and work on, on the one for Honolulu that Philip Moiser, the owner of the company, has asked us to do. And this project here is in that book. And it's by a young firm, as we stayed down there, they're called Ultra Modern. That seems like a promising term to call themselves as a company. And it's at that Grand Park Museum area. So you walk down Michigan, Michigan a Mile, Magnificent Avenue, and then cut corner to the lake, which you see there. And there it's standing there. And it was going through the magazines. It was really a, a fresh breath which it still is. Uh, I threw in a picture at the bottom left when it was new, but um, it's weathering uh, quite heavily as we can see in the details I took because Chicago has the same as us. It's fronting the ocean. That lake is not salty as our ocean is, but the winds are blowing. And so it's quite harsh on wood. And so we want to share that, but uh, get us right and not wrong, because we're, we don't want to complain here and say this is bad. Um, it looks ugly, tear it down. Uh, I'm saying it's great, actually to the degree to point out to people where the, where the challenges are, but also where the, pot where the potential is of wood. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we see uh, why I say we are um, appreciative of that because both in our practice and in our coaching here, we have several examples of um, our fascination with solid timber um, as the, the left uh, column and the, the top uh, row basically shows um, two projects, the solid timber um, handicap school at the top right and in the middle top is the uh, Eco Woodbox Kindergarten, the first off the grid passive false kindergarten for our hometown. That one is a balloon frame, as you call originally the good American uh, construction methods of, of light frame. And they both made it into the Hanover edition of the book. But more importantly, down there, we see the emerging generation being encouraged from my um, prairie days in the very center, met the boar actually proposing high rises out of solid timber. At the very bottom, we see Megan Sarkozy with solid timber, um, cross-laminated timber and nanogel insulated uh, systems with a thermally modified rain screen and uh, very familiar to us at the middle on the right column, we see Kelly Keanu who was looking into coconut wood into palm trees and using them for solid timber. All very, very promising. And next slide. I also went back to uh, the handicapped school here. Uh, this turned out to be the largest, um, as far as square footage, application of thermally modified timber, spruce uh, and pine wood. And uh, little did we know how pioneering it was. And probably if we would have known, we probably still wouldn't have told our public John and client who's only allowed to use things that have been, you know, experienced for 30 years or so, which we find kind of tragic because that way the public can never be 
you know, at the forefront and, and show the, the mass uh, what one should do. So we, we try that. And uh, although on the right side, you might say, oh, it kind of looks like, you know, it has some green on maybe, you know, but uh, that's just surface. This is uh, in its defense, that's the north side. So it never gets sun. There is this heavy wooded alley. It's always moist there. And considering that, it's actually holding up fairly, fairly well. And one of the tricks that also, it not just holds up technically well, but also aesthetically well, because what people don't like is an uneven weathering of wood. That makes them feel like it looks kind of shabby. So we said we can basically control that by making everything flush. By using such a wood that is so resistant through its family modification process, um, it can actually weather without additional weather protection. And that's why we made the uh, um, um, aluminum wood. Uh, Feltback is the company's name, a Danish manufacturer of windows and um, uh, all the flashing, everything is flush. So the whole thing basically weathers quite well. Next slide. Um, I, uh, I went to you because I needed a little bit of therapy and you basically then tried to comfort me or I, 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 you, know, you informed me about the differences in copyrights of human rights. You remember that? <laughs> yes, I can talk about copyright if you want me to. <laughs> well, anyways, I, I called you because I was still down because I went to the school I introduced myself to the new director uh, with the last ones. We weren't so uh, warm. And this one here was a very, very warm welcoming. And I was so, I guess, enthused that I started to, with her permission to walk around. And then I snapped some pictures here and there. The scenario, um, we had another thunderstorm and they were playing music down there. And then the rain was playing uh, drums on the ETF e file, which we will go back and explain a little bit more in detail when we are back with Matt uh, Noblet next week. Anyways, on the way out, a very huge teacher went in my way and said, not a good idea. Uh, you are not supposed to take any picture pictures and I'm supposed to delete them all, which he did. Uh, this one here slipped through and hopefully, you know, we don't violate privacy too much because the people are almost unnoticeable, at least not their personality here. So that's that's the only picture, as we were saying, more reason to say come with me and check it out because that seems to be the predominant uh, way to to do it um i i compared it to um the analogy of the usm hala have you in some office or private residence seen them as furniture the soto no i can't remember i don't okay. believe so yeah but... they're from the the good old 60s that we're talking about that you are from as well, you know, the early, the late, just before that, and I'm from the 60s. So um, you were in your, in your, you know, or young child age in the 60s. So uh, Fritz Haller, an architect, uh, invented this here with a company and it, it became a classic. It's actually since 2021, it's in the Museum of Modern Art. And I read in 2006, they furnished the, uh, the, the office in the Museum of Modern Art with it. So it's a very iconic, it's very cleverly designed. It's out of these, uh, you know, um, uh, basically chrome steel tubes that have that special corner connector, as you can see, and there goes, you know, threaded rods through and you need a special tool to make that happen. Very cleverly designed and very sort of authentic. What, what you know, you, you get what you see. And that's kind of the, the, the philosophy of the, of the school as well, where everything what you see except on this wall actually because the the top floor the structural engineer thought he needed to use steel so it's in in this case it's cladding but in all the other areas it's actually structural so what you see is actually what you get and vice versa um next slide uh we we have been informed that um they will add on to the school and uh, they had not asked us which honestly i'm not unhappy about it I think I've been there, done it, and I'm, you know, I'm okay. Uh, now I'm in the critical position to still uh, try to not be too biased because, of course, being the author of the original. So, uh, but I allow myself, you know, some uh, some observation about it, and you know, feel free to chip in 
uh, please, because the in that in that construction uh, poster there, everything that's white is the original, and everything that's dark gray is the is the new. Um, and what's finished is that new bar, which is several classrooms. And then I guess they're going to add two more in front of the ends of the of the existing building, right? And um, so I compared it, um, you know, a little snarky to the at the bottom right. There's a company here that actually sells like Starbucks coffee primarily, but then has merchandise and a like a Sears catalog on the side, and you can stuff like buy like even furniture, as in this case here. So then I think to basically not get copyright busted they couldn't copycat the exact corner connection and they made this different one which seems like if you know the original that we just saw before you think like okay it's like extending out too much it's like a horn it's not supposed to be there and so it is with a building that's why it's my analogy you see there's a gutter and the gutter is technically you know we had some issues with leaking roofs that luckily the director said it's not the architect's fault it was the contractor and says, I like to hear that you don't know how smooth this goes down. I don't hear that too often. And that was nice of her. So they're, they're grantedly a little, um, you know, um, uh, paranoid because of what, what happened. Uh, but if, if that needed really to go to say, okay, I don't do an integrated uh, drainage, but I put the gutter on the outside, I'm not so sure. They also, which you don't see, but I tell you, they went on the safe side and did a frame system, a balloon frame system that we're not, again, we had that in the eco wood box as well. But I think I can bear it again to the furniture. If you have a living room or an office, uh, you know, equipped with the original and you need a couple more pieces, wouldn't you just continue? So what I would have suggested is I provide my construction documents, all the specs, and they could have just follow that. And of course, optimize. That's why we do the post occupancy elevation. I, I, I'm less interested in what's to be celebrated and what works perfect, but what doesn't work because from mistakes we learn and not from success, right? And I want to just say that that picture of the metal framework, that protruding piece at the top may look like it's not that significant, but in reality, those are the types of things in actual practice that end up driving you nuts because you constantly bang into them. You you know you tear your clothes on them. You they it isn't just aesthetic. There is a reason yeah. why the original doesn't yeah, have that. Yeah, yeah. And this and is glad, the type of thing that would in practice make you nuts. I'm, I think. I'm glad I'm glad you say that. And the analogy back to metal in the building, you see that um, that downspout. And uh, Mike, if you can go back one slide. Uh, you see on the exterior that we basically also integrated the gutters as square gutters to be flush with the facade because banging them, you know, um, this they like to knock on them and drum on them and they don't like that because they're of, of zinc metal that is not very thick. So there is a practical advantage of that too besides yes. the, uh, the aesthetical one. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's use the last four minutes to uh, go to the next slide because this is looking forward to more solid timber uh, because this is where the trend is going and uh, there is no real reason to shy away from it. And this is uh, on my trip uh, to the neighboring big city of Hamburg. And this is, I'm, I'm not going to do another G German lesson for you to sort of that's too mean because that's too much here. Here in steht das höchste Holzgebäude Deutschlands, or you want to give it a try? Probably not. So I'm helping you out. All I, all I can get is Deutschland is at the end and it's German. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the tallest uh, wooden high rise is going up currently here. It's actually 18 floors and 180 condominiums. Uh, and apartments, a good mix. And it's structurally out of timber. It has a concrete core, the elevator core, the staircase, but everything else, the walls and the ceilings, the ceilings are actually side nail timber, just like in the Elmazi school that we just saw. So we're very happy to see that catching on and people, you know, continuing to do that. Um, and um, I, I pose myself in our tradition of automobiles and architecture in front of a car that's very familiar to us, right? 
Is it's that your is is that the same car that I'm familiar with? That you it's, it's, it is it is like mine, but it's not okay. mine because I took the train as a responsible commuter these days. And this is a Twingo, yes, and it has yeah. a sliding. Ours has a folding uh, sunroof. This has a sliding sunroof, and um, the building has bioclimatic um, uh, cooling too because on the construction rendering we see that it's going to be lanai all the way around. So I think that's very promising. Uh, hope you too, DeSoto. And this is now for Rainer Kiesling, who is our emerging colleague, who you see at the top right, who's going to take this on to surprise us to bring this to us in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we will be his advocate and use uh, best practices from half around the world, because what works here should work there. Too. So now you You're are quite telling me astonished. That structurally, this 18-story building is supported by wood? Yeah, it is. It is. And I took the close-up at the bottom left, which you see the wood, the solid, uh, or the, the structural uh, walls. And uh, at the top uh, picture above this here, um, I was looking it up. And also the siding, the rain screen is also out of timber. So it's pretty entirely out of timber except the very inner core, most likely for the vertical circulation right. of the staircase and the elevators right. is, is out of concrete, but everything else is. So, and so um, in these pictures, there is a metal framework on the exterior. Is that purely for construction? That's, yeah, that's scaffolding for construction, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. okay, you have, to, you have to keep me appraised of this because I'm astounded to think of an 18-story wooden building. See, so um, uh, you uh, you know, uh, Rainer will will show it to us, and we will coach him. And you know, they catchily say, "Close to heaven, down to earth." Yes, I saw that because that's an English. I can read that. Of, uh, yeah, of promoting that, and it will be finished um, sometime soon, and at the beginning, first quarter of twenty twenty four. So we will keep. Um, everyone updated on that one, the audience and us, and. Uh, uh, so far, this is it for, for this week. We didn't get much to Chicago, but there was too much to catch up here from me driving around, which is important too, but promise we will go back to Chicago. And so if you are joining us again. We will start out then with the Apple store that we have one too. We actually have two of them, uh, one in the mall and one on Kalakaua Avenue, just across the corner from us. And this one here gets us very exciting because it's by one of the architects who we have been following. That is, uh, that is Lord um, oh, Baron uh, Norman Foster, the British high-tech architect who was a pioneer in bioclimatic design. So how did he do that with an Apple store? You have to sign in next week again to hear about that and see that. All right. So until then, just sort of have a good week. and. Uh, Hopefully we see um, Matt back next week for his Spanish Boston boost. And until then, you guys all stay safe and sound. Sound and safe. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.